So good afternoon. My name is Jacqueline Bilston. I'm a software developer at Yelp on the Clickstream Analytics team. And today I want to tell you the story of how I learned to efficiently test my ETL pipelines. And the slide is not going forward. There we go. Oop. These are my talk resources. If you're the type of person that likes to wait until the end of a talk before you know if it's interesting enough to download the resources, don't worry, I am showing this slide at the end of the talk too. But I do think that this talk is really interesting and I have a lot of good stuff to share and I want to make sure I have time to get through it all. So if you could please leave your questions until the end, I promise to take some time and try to answer as many of them as I can. Our story starts with a frog. This is a Xenopus frog. And it's important for our story because it is responsible for the very first time I ever came into contact with anything that resembled an ETL pipeline. For my very first job out of university, I was a bioinformatician. And it was my job to extract genetic and genomic information about this frog from labs around the world transform it into a format that could be interpreted by our genome browser, and then load it up into our genome browser so that our scientists and researchers could use it to make discoveries. That's what ETL stands for, by the way, extract, transform, and load. You're at a data conference, but just in case you didn't know that. The year that I graduated university, the Nobel Prize in Medicine was won by a Xenopus researcher. And I felt extremely privileged to be enabling this research. I really, really wanted to do a good job. Unfortunately, I made a lot of little mistakes. And each time I made a mistake, I'd have to fix it and then manually set up and rerun the affected section of the pipeline to be sure it was really gone. This setup and rerun could take anywhere from 20 minutes to two hours. And sometimes in the setting up and rerunning to make sure that it was really gone, I would make a mistake in the order of steps that I used to set things up. I would skip a step and it would look like the bug was still there, but it wasn't and I'd have to do it again. And it was frustrating. I was essentially a junior developer without much mentorship. I didn't know about automated tests. All that I knew was that I was slow and I was letting my team down. When I discovered that I could get a computer to do all of this work for me, I felt free. Computers run steps in exactly the same order every single time, and they do things in parallel, so they're way faster than us humans are. And when I got to Yelp, and we had 100% test coverage in the areas of the pipelines we were working on, I felt like I'd found my people. I was never going to be slowed down by a silly little mistake ever again. I was wrong. <laughs> this is a bug. Uh, it's not a real bug. It's one that I've invented so that I can share my code with you after this presentation. But it is definitely based off of real bugs that have actually happened at Yelp. And like all of the best bugs, it happened on a Friday afternoon, just as I was about to leave work. A data scientist named Jenna came to me and said, the number of interactions in the pandemic recovery table doesn't look right. Now, our tests were all green. Everything was good. There were no alerts. But Jenna is the type of data scientist who is incredibly meticulous. She almost has a sixth sense for her data. So if she said that something didn't look right, it was important for us to check it out. So I did. This is the pandemic recovery table. It's a table that we use to track the recovery of small businesses through the pandemic. And the way that we do that is by counting the number of interactions our users have with the small businesses on the Yelp website and app. An interaction could be something like leaving a review about your favorite Mexican restaurant checking in at a concert, or leaving a tip about the best place to find parking at your dentist. We sum all of those up into the interaction count column here. What Jenna showed me when she showed me this table was that the number of interactions, they were wrong. But they weren't wrong because we were adding things up incorrectly. 
They were wrong because the number of reviews was incorrect. This was a problem because Jenna was right. There, there was a bug somewhere. And we weren't the end users of this data. We had multiple downstream teams that relied on us. And we had to go to all of them and say, this data has an issue. Um, we don't know what the problem is. We don't know when it will be fixed, but you might want to stop using it for now. I don't know if you've ever had to have a conversation like that with any of your users, but the clock starts ticking pretty fast. So we dove in to find the issue. There was just one problem. This is a diagram one of my teammates made of half of the system of pipelines that we maintain at Yelp. And we knew where the bad data was, but it was generated by a series of upstream jobs and all of them had passing automated tests. So we had to manually dig in to try and find the source of this bug. And it took us five days to find it. But not only did it take us five days to find it, because our tests were passing, they were green, we couldn't rely on them to tell us that we'd actually fixed it. It took us three days manually setting up and rerunning the impacted section of the pipeline to be sure that that bug was really gone. The most infuriating part of this is it was a one-line fix. This is the profile page of the Yelp app. On this page, you have the option to check in. And when you did that, we incremented the check-in count column of that pandemic recovery table. You also have the option to leave a review. And when you do that, we increment the review count section of the pandemic recovery table. Our product owners had come to us and said that these two were so close together that users would often leave a review and check in at the same time. That wasn't two interactions. It was really one. So they asked us to remove any mobile reviews that matched a check-in on user ID, business ID, and date. We knew what we wanted. This is something in PySpark. It's a left anti-join. Unfortunately, there's another type of join in PySpark. This is the default. This is an inner join. The inner join returns all of the data that is shared between two data sets based on those parameters. And in order to get a left anti-join, you have to add a parameter into your function call. We'd forgotten that parameter. Simple, right? Still took us three days to fix it. Not only did it take us three days to fix it, we had to spend seven days running backfills to replace two months of bad data. It was frustrating. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. So I decided to dive in to take a look at our testing strategy to figure out why it had missed that, because a lot of these inefficiencies could have been fixed by those tests. We had two layers of tests for our pipeline. The first layer is what I call data tests. These are tests that are run on your data in production. They check to see if your data conforms to a certain set of rules. They'll tell you, for example, if you have duplicate values that shouldn't be there, nulls that shouldn't be there, or some value that is completely outside of the range of possibility. These tests are amazing because they tell me things about my data and about what my pipeline is doing that I could never predict. But these were not the tests that I expected to catch this bug because the data, it wasn't wildly outside of the realm of possibility. It conformed to all the rules we wanted. It was just still wrong. The, the tests that I expected to catch this bug are what I call logic tests. These are sort of like unit tests or integration tests. We write them with PyTest. And these verify that for the exact same input, your code produces the exact same output. These are valuable because, like I said earlier, developers make lots of little mistakes, and these help us catch them. We had one large logic test. And in order to add test cases to it, we would add a row to the input data frames, 
And then we had a large output data frame where we'd add a row to that and check that the output, the expected output data frame matched what we expected. These tests gave us 100% coverage. And in addition to that, when we looked at them, it became even more mysterious. They were actually testing for the buggy behavior. They were very that. Not the behavior we expected. That was weird. I was stuck. And thankfully, when I'm stuck, I have a wise old developer I can ask for help. If Uncle Iroh existed in real life for code, his name would be Jay Bazuzzi. Jay is a principal developer at Tableau. He is passionate about testing. But not only is he passionate about testing, he's one of the smartest people I know who really cares about building up the people that he works with and the people in his community. I went to Jay and I said, Jay, we had this test. It tested everything. It took in all of the data we could have expected, and it checked that it matched what we wanted, and it gave us 100% coverage, and I don't know why it broke, or why it didn't break, why it didn't fail. Jay, being the wise old developer he is, um, looked at me and answered my question with a question. What bug are you trying to catch? I said, Jay, that doesn't make any sense. The whole reason we write these tests is to catch all of the bugs. What do you mean, what bug am I trying to catch? And Jay said, go away, think about it, look at your tests, and come back. So I did. This was our logic test. In order to test the feature that I'd added, the feature that had caused the bug, I needed to add a row into a JSON file here, or add a, an entry into a JSON file. Those JSON files got converted into data frames. The data frames were then passed into the transform function of the pipeline we were testing, and we verified that the actual output matched the expected output that is stored in another large JSON file. And then I realized this is where the problem was. Because you see, with all of those input test cases being tested by the same test, this is what our expected JSON file looked like. It was big. And when I updated my inputs to add that new test case, my output no longer matched this expected JSON file. So I looked at my new test case, and I looked at the outputs, and I saw that the new, the new entry matched exactly what I expected it to. But we were running all of the other data through the, all the other test data through the exact same pipeline, which meant that all of the other test data also got changed. And I was not about to go through 40 different input test cases to make sure that I knew exactly how the number of interactions and number of reviews should have changed. I mean, those test cases weren't important for the behavior I wanted. Like, I'd already written a test case that verified the behavior. So I looked at the old values and I saw that the num interactions updated properly, or the old values that were stored, and I saw that the num interactions was updated properly. I looked at the new values that were coming out of my function and I saw that, you know, the num interactions and num reviews were the only things that were changing and they looked okay. And then I did what any good lazy developer does when they have to write a large file. And I uncommented the commented overwrite expected with actual data frame function at the bottom of my test. This overwrote the entire expected JSON file with what was coming out of the actual data frame, which meant the buggy behavior was there, and I wrote the bug into my tests. I went back to Jay, and I said, Jay, I get it. I had one big test, it was testing everything, and it was impossible for me to identify what was important. But all that I have right now is this big test. It's still keeping a lot of good behavior in place, and I don't know how to reduce it. And Jay decided to answer me with another question. 
have you ever heard of a staff squeeze? I said no. But I'm going to be a good student, and I'm going to go out and find this staff squeeze for myself. Everything is available on Google these days, right? When I searched for this staff squeeze, it was available in literally two places on the internet. The first was an obscure Stack Overflow post because everything is on Stack Overflow. And the second was Kent Beck's original blog post about the Saf squeeze that he'd written in 2008 when he worked on the JUnit project with David Saf. From this, I kind of gathered that a Saf squeeze was a way of debugging your code with automated tests, but I didn't see how it applied to my use case because the bug was already fixed. So I went back to Jay and asked him to clarify, and he did. Because one of the side effects of a SAF squeeze isn't just that you're able to find the buggy code. The SAF squeeze actually will reduce the test you're using to find the bug down to a test that is highly specific for that buggy behavior. Now, if instead of the buggy behavior, you test for the important behavior, or if you already have a test working, you write an assertion that's very specific for that important behavior, you can do the same thing. You can use the mechanics of a SAF squeeze to reduce your test down to exactly what is needed to reproduce the important behavior you care about. So let's try it out. This is the large test. The first thing I'm going to do because I don't want to remove the large test, I still want it in place, it's still providing me value, is I want to duplicate it. Then I'm going to go into the duplicated test and rename it to something a little bit more specific to the behavior that I'm trying to test for. As a reminder, this is the bug. We, had, we were using an inner join, which meant that one mobile review without any check-ins would count as no reviews, and a mobile review that matched a check-in would count as a separate review. And what we wanted was the opposite. We wanted one mobile review without any matching check-ins to count as a distinct review on its own, but if it did match a check-in, we didn't want to count that review. I'm going to start by making a test that is very, very specific for this first case. The, te the test is going to verify that for one mobile review, without any check-ins, we get one review. So that's the name I'm going to give this test. Test will count mobile reviews without matching check-ins. Now, this test is giving us 100% coverage, and the bug is fixed. So we're already verifying this behavior. We already have that important test case in here. And in this case, the important entry to add test for this behavior is in the mobile reviews JSON file. If we take a look at that file and scroll all the way to the bottom, way down there, it's a big file, you'll see the entry that doesn't match any check-ins. Now, I like to be able to read things and identify things easily when I refactor, so this long string of numbers and letters is not really helpful to me. I'm going to change it to something a little bit more useful and easier to identify. This is what we're testing for, which is mobile review, no check-ins, and the business ID is the primary identifier, the primary key on that output table, so it's going to follow my data through the pipeline. Next thing that I'm going to do is make sure that my test passes, and I want to call your attention to the green gem at the bottom left there. For the rest of this presentation, I'm going to be running a lot of tests. Every time I run a test, if you see that green gem, it means it passed. If you see a red X, that means it's failed. Once we've made sure the test passes and that the changes we are making, that any failures would be caused by the changes that we are making, we're going to look at the anatomy of the test. All logic tests can be broken apart into three chunks. The arranged chunk, which sets up your test so that you're providing the same input every single time the act chunk, which runs the code that you care about, and the assert chunk that checks that for the exact same input, you're getting the output you expect. The assert is where we're going to start. This is what we need to make specific 
to test for that, that important behavior. We don't need to overwrite any expected JSON files anymore, so I'm going to delete that comment. And now let's take a look at what we're testing. We're testing that this actual data frame matches that expected JSON file. If I take a look at what that actual data frame looks like when it's converted into JSON, I can see right at the top, or this, we're testing the entire file, and I don't care about the entire file for this specific behavior. I care about the output of that one test case, which in this case is the mobile review no check-ins right at the top here. It's the first entry in the data frame. In order to make the assertion specific, I'm going to add an index onto those JSON files so that I'm testing the first element matches. But for this very important behavior, I don't care about the entire entry. The behavior that I'm testing is relevant to just the business ID, so I make sure that I'm testing the right element, and the number of reviews, because I want to make sure I'm getting the right output of reviews. So in order to make this even more specific, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to test with JSON files at all. I'm actually just going to assert on the properties that I care about. And th in this case, I'm checking that the business ID is the mobile review no check-ins business ID, and the num reviews is one. I like to be able to read my code when I'm working with it, and I like, it to be able, I like to be able to manipulate it easily. And this is two lines that don't really tell me much, so I'm going to extract this into a method, an assertion method, so that I can actually follow this code, follow the, um, manipulate that assertion more easily. And this assertion method here is what I'm going to drop into the bottom of my test. This assertion is now so specific that the only way this test fails is if something has changed with that important behavior. The next step of the, st of the SAF squeeze is actually to start squeezing. So we're going to grab that transform function in our act block. And right now, because we're running the entire transform function, we are actually testing every single step through that transform function. And not all of them are important for the behavior we care about. So in order to figure out which steps are important for the behavior I care about, I'm going to inline that transform function. I'm going to copy the contents of the transform function into my test. Then I'm going to grab my assertion and I'm going to walk it up one statement at a time. After I walk it up one statement at a time, I'm going to run my test. You see the red X? My test failed. That means that there's something in this line below my assertion that's important for that assertion. In this case, I can see that the actual data frame isn't defined above that point, and I don't know what the construct post-pandemic recovery data frame does to define it, so I'm going to do another inline of that function so that I can see what's going on. I can see right away that the pandemic recovery data frame variable is being assigned to the actual data frame variable. So I'm going to run my test on the pandemic recovery data frame variable instead and delete that assignment. And now I'm going to start walking up one statement at a time, running my tests. In this case, it passes. And that means that the code below that assert statement is not important for the behavior I care about. So I can delete it. I'm going to keep walking up one line at a time, running my tests, watching them pass, and deleting the code below them all the way until I reach a failure. Now, in this case, in order to figure out why this is important, I'm going to look at the failure's error message. And here I'm getting a key error for the number of reviews. If I print out the schema of the two data frames I'm joining here, the pandemic recovery data frame and the reviews data frame, I'm able to see that the pandemic recovery data frame has a business ID but no num reviews. And that's what I'm testing on that data frame. And the reviews data frame has both. So all that I have to do is take that reviews data frame and assert on the reviews data frame instead of the pandemic recovery data frame. 
then I'm going to walk it up one line at a time again, run my tests, they pass, that behavior is still being preserved and the, I can delete the line below it, walk it up one more line, run my tests, they pass, I can delete the line below it, I'm gonna keep going until I reach my next failure. And this is the count reviews function. If I take a look at this count reviews function, I see something pretty cool. That's the join that caused the bug. Because I've found the first line of code that is relevant to the behavior I'm testing for, that means I've squeezed the bottom as much as I can, and it's time to start squeezing the top. Squeezing the top is probably better called simplifying the top. What you're trying to do in this case, because you're not actually squeezing the code like you can when you squeeze the bottom, is you're trying to reduce it down to the minimum number of inputs that you need in order to reproduce that behavior you care about. So what I'm going to do is I can first see that there are two data frames which are no longer used because I deleted all of that unimportant code from the bottom. I'm just gonna delete those input data frames. I don't need them. Next thing that I see is a little bit weird. It's called create check-in data frame with one date per row. And the reason that this is weird is it's actually part of our act function because it's part of our system under test. And when you run a logic test, you usually only want one thing in that act function because you want to be testing one thing. Thankfully, what we're testing is that one mobile review without any matching check-ins will count as one review. So all that I really need to do is create an empty data frame with the columns that we care about for this join and assign that to my check-in data frame. And now I can delete the portion where I was reading that check-in JSON file. I've just simplified that input a lot more. And, that the, and now that check-in data frame is actually part of my act function. I can make this simpler. I only care about mobile reviews, not reviews. So I already have an empty data frame that I'm using for my check-in. I might as well assign that to my browser reviews too, because I really don't care for my behavior that I'm testing what the browser reviews are doing. And then, I'm gonna take a look at that mobile reviews data frame because it's importing that entire mobile reviews JSON file and we're using an index in that assert, which means if, that, if I add another element to that JSON file, there's a pretty good chance that my test fails. So I'm going to make this even simpler to only test for the behavior I care about. I'm actually gonna put some values in this data frame and then, oops, sorry, I went backwards. Then I'm going to assign that data frame with one mobile review in it with the values that I care about to my mobile reviews data frame. And that is my simpler test, which is kind of cool. Also a lot of work. So one of the questions that I get whenever I start making a quality improvement in my code is, is it worth it? That's a really hard question to answer after the first time. And that's because of something that I've observed, it's not scientific or anything, but I've also heard other developers talking about it, which is the zero to one phenomenon. And that means that whenever you're making a quality improvement in your code, measuring whether or not it's worth it is really hard to do off of the first attempt at it because you're learning and you're building infrastructure and you're doing things that make all of the subsequent attempts easier. So, the way that you measure whether a quality improvement is worth it or not is by how easy it is to do the second or third time. Thankfully, we've written one test for this feature, but we have two tests we need to write in order to fully test it. The second test is that one mobile review with one check-in will count as no reviews. So the first thing that I'm going to do, because I want to keep my original specific test, is I'm going to duplicate it. And then 
I'm going to give it a name that is specific for what I'm testing for, which in this case is test mobile reviews count with check-ins. The next thing that I'm going to do is change that assertion to make it more specific. And instead of having one review, I want it to count as none because it matches a check-in, so we should be filtering it out. And the test fails because I haven't changed any of the input values. I haven't changed any of the actual stuff going into my test. So what I'm going to do is update this review. I'm going to rename it to something called matching on because I want a check-in that matches and we're going to match on these fields because that's what we use to filter things out. Then I'm gonna grab my check-in data frame. I'm gonna move it up so that it's grouped with a similar thing. And I'm gonna re replace the empty data frame in my check-in data frame with the matching on. And then I run my test and it passes. That is much simpler. Now, I may have made it sound like at Yelp now I'm prescribing we have a bunch of really bug-specific, behavior-specific tests and you test everything down to like the nth detail. This isn't quite what our tests look like at the moment. We still have that large logic test in place. We're still learning and the SAF squeeze is one of many tools in our toolbox that we use to test our code efficiently, but it's definitely something that is very useful and helpful, especially when you're dealing with legacy tests that are quite large. One question I get a lot when I talk about the SAF squeeze and behavior specific tests is, okay, well you have 100 tests for your feature. I mean, if you change anything, you're gonna have to update 100 tests, aren't you? That's like terribly inefficient. But the thing about these tests is that they are so specific to the behavior that you care about. The only way they change is if the behavior you care about changes. And the way that that happens is one of two ways. Either you have a bug and you want them to fail because you want them to tell you that you have that bug, or you've actually changed that behavior in which case you really should be updating your tests. I had a feature with it was covered about with 20 tests and I had to change a top level function, a top level behavior. I only had to update two, two tests. The other thing I wanted to say about this is that it has already saved us days of work as a development team when we find bugs with these tests. We can fix them in usually a half an hour to an hour's worth of work because we know exactly where the issue is. Whereas if a bug is found with a very large logic test, then it's harder to figure out what's causing it. These again are my talk resources, um, if you wanna take a picture of those. And they're up in the top left corner of this slide, sorry, the, yeah, top, top right corner for you. The top right corner of this slide still. Um, I wanted to say thank you to everyone listed on this slide. They were really helpful and made a huge contribution to how this talk turned out. Um, and yeah, I guess I have like two minutes for questions now. I think we can take one question. We have one minute. Do you ever have trouble, uh, you know, recreating the structure of your data that you use for a specific case, like the, uh, you know, schema and format? Oh, I like this question. So the question was, do I ever have any trouble recreating the structure of my data that I use for this for these tests, like the schema and the the format? So these are like those are important attributes of the data that we're testing with. Uh, one of the tools that I do use to make sure that I'm testing the schema properly is a tool called CHISPA, which verifies that the schema, it actually verifies the elements in the schema. Um, and this, because the structure and the format of my data is important, I would actually have a behavior specific test to make sure that I'm producing 
that structure and behavior, but instead of having maybe five or six that are all testing that schema and behavior, I would have one large test that, or one larger, not large, but one larger test that checks the entire data frame is coming out the way that it should, and then I have a bunch of smaller bug-specific tests that verify the um, structure, like verify the very, very specific behaviors of the transformation I'm trying to achieve. 